Uh, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the seventh meeting in 2013 of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Uh, as usual, can I ask everyone to ensure they have switched off mobile phones and other electronic devices, please. Uh, agenda item one is the High Hedges Scotland Bill Stage 2 Procedure. Um, the business today is to undertake the Stage 2 consideration of the High Hedges Scotland Bill. I'd like to welcome Mark MacDonald, the member in charge of the bill, Derek Mackay, uh, Minister for Local Government and Planning, who has portfolio responsibility for the subject matter of the bill, Christine Graham, who is attending to speak and move an amendment in her name, uh, and I also welcome Sarah Boyack, who is joining us today. Uh, before we move on to consideration of the amendments, I think it would be helpful if I set out the procedure for stage two consideration. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the marshalled list of amendments that was published on Monday, and the groupings of amendments which sets out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in each group to speak to and move their amendment and to speak to all of the other amendments in the group. Members who have not lodged amendment, amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate that by catching my attention in the usual way. Uh, if they have not already spoken in the group, I will invite the minister and then the member in charge to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. Uh, the debate on each group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the First Amendment in the group to wind up. Following debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press their amendment to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If any committee member objects, the committee must immediately move to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when I call it, they should say not moved. Please remember that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote at stage two. Voting in any division is by show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally, formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, and so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. Um, and if I can move on uh, to uh, the first amendment uh, in the name of Anne McTaggart, uh, grouped with amendments 2 uh, and 19. Anne McTaggart, uh, to move amendment 1 and to speak to all other amendments in the group, please. Thanks, convener. Um, good morning, panel. Whilst I welcome the High Hedges Scotland Bill, I am concerned that the exclusion of deciduous species will leave some of the worst long-standing disputes and many of those who suffer from high hedges of a neighbouring property without a resolution to the problems they face. Scott Hedge conducted a survey in 2009 which concluded that almost a fifth, that's 20%, of the respondents suffered from deciduous hedges such as beech or rows of deciduous trees. The argument that deciduous species should not be included is unsatisfactory. In the months that we have light, the leaves will be on. Therefore, views are still blocked by neighbouring properties during the summer months. Evidence presented to the, this committee argued that in the west of Scotland, the cloud cover can be so dense that even in March, dry days can be, it can be dark. What actually happens to the plant depends on the the temperature and also the wind. Therefore, we cannot be certain that deciduous trees won't be a problem for the winter. Equally, evergreens can also lose their leaves in certain conditions. The difference between evergreen and deciduous species are minimal in practice, and it is not logical to offer remedies for evergreens but not deciduous. This is merely a te technal technicality, sorry which will frustrate many innocent homeowners suffering from neighbour disputes. Therefore, it would be grossly unfair if deciduous species were excluded from protection by a Scottish High Hedge Bill, where vindictive intent or delight in bullying is, is involved. An evergreen hedge will be, simply 
replaced by a deciduous one to escape a remedial order requiring removal of the hedge. The English legislation, of which we studied within the Local Government Committee, was limited to evergreen hedging in the belief that local authorities would be swamped by high hedge complaints. This has since proven not to be the case. I ask the member to consider the inclusion of decisions into the bill's intent. Thank you. Uh, can I call on Christine Graham to speak to Amendment 2 and other amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you very much, convener. I'll speak to more amendment and then, if I may, speak to the other two within that group. Um, we appreciate the genesis of this was the, you know, the, the growth literally of Leylandi, probably the fact that we get smaller gardens, we have more house units packed together, and people now have a culture of wanting their outdoor space in their garden. So we appreciate it, and we've moved on from it just being Leylandi, which I'm pleased about. It, however, I have concerns at limiting it to shrub. Uh, I may bore the committee by giving the definition of shrub, which is a woody perennial plant, smaller than a tree, with several major branches arising from near the base of the main stem. Now, I note that during the stage one uh, proceedings in this committee, the word plant was frequently used, and I wasn't quite sure why that was ditched uh, for shrub. Because, you see, the term... I can see you're intensely interested in this. I feel I'm on Gardener's World. Um, you can see that this doesn't deal, for example, with Russian vine, uh, which is, you know, a very fast-growing plant, uh, from a meso ugly, ivy, which has its moments, or indeed Clematis montana rubens. These are all vigorous growers. Now, I've got experience of the two latter. Ivy, not my fault, but ivy is now meandering through at least two or three gardens near me, including my own, and difficult to remove, and can grow to some height. Uh, but it gets, and it gets everywhere, dark and green and evergreen, but not covered by this. Clematis Montana Rubin's my fault. I planted it and I forgot to look at it for a couple of years and it's in everybody's trees. Now again, that's pretty well, uh, although it can or cannot lose its leaves, it depends on the season. Again, it's a very vigorous plant. Now they're just three examples. Now the point I'm making is that if you had a neighbour, and we know there are neighbours like this unfortunately, determined to defeat the act, then why not plant ivy or any of the aforesaid? Mm -hmm. Because the key in the legislation, as I understand it, is the height, to some extent the purpose, although that's more inferred than stated, and deprivation of light. And if you can achieve that with plants rather than just shrubs eh, and evergreens and even deciduous, then I think it should be considered, because the effect might be the same as ubiquitous laurel or privet or leylandi. Now, I want to, so that's the point. Um, this is a probing amendment. I, I, I'm putting it down in front of you. I'm sure you've discussed it, but um, I've come into this late, but I think it's something that should perhaps be addressed by the member in charge. With regard to Anne McTaggart's um, amendment, I supported that. I think I said at stage one, I feel an amendment coming on. Obviously, Anne McTaggart felt it coming on faster than me. Uh, I'm very sympathetic uh, to this because, again, depending on what part of the country you're in, if you're in the west or the southwest in Friesland Galloway, the beech doesn't lose its leaves. And in fact, in Edinburgh, I know that a big beech edge it never lost its leaves and remained, you know, a great wall to the outside world. Um, so I think that that should be given a consideration. Margaret Mitchell's as well, I'm sympathetic to. I think again at uh, the stage one debate, I was concerned about the power of ministers to vary what I thought was the definition of hedge, and I was given, I think I called it ultra varies, and was um, informed that no, no, it's perfectly within the competence. But I've still got concern, I'm sympathetic, that we make it clear that what a hedge is, that's the two or more plants, can't get tampered with, that what was intended was perhaps the composition uh, as we look, as this progresses, the composition of that mix, perhaps, of evergreen and deciduous, and in my case, plants. Thank you, Ms Graham. When you started off there talking about genesis, I thought you were going to bring uh, reptiles into uh, the equation as well as, uh, as plant life. A, a tree and a serpent, if I remember rightly. Can I ask Margaret Mitchell to speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in the group, please? All right, thank you very much, Convener. Starting with my Amendment 19, this uh, amendment restricts the ability of ministers to exercise the power under Section 34 to alter the definition 
of a high hedge in that the amendment specifically confines this power to allowing regulations under 34 to change only the content of these regulations under section 1.1 and not to rewrite them completely. Um, both the subordinate legislation and the local government and regeneration committees noted the power on ministers by section 34, conferred on them by section 34, is very wide ranging in its ambu and I would venture to say unusually so. In fact, the subordinate legislation committee noted in its report on the bill that the section 34 power could be used to amend the definition of a high head to such an extent as to fall outside the clear purpose of the bill. Not only that, but it could also allow uh, amendment by ministers which would contravene the powers granted to the, the government by the parliament to make reasonable adjustment to the law without the need to return to the parliament. Both the minister and the member in charge said that this was not the intention of the power granted under section 34 and that it would be used, as the minister gave us an example, say to change the height um, of a high hedge from two to three metres. And whilst I note that the, minister in uh, the member in charge says he will include this in an explanatory note, I think this amendment goes further and provides more clarity in that the power is restricted to the extent it's intended to be used. Uh, turning now to Anne McTaggart's amendment, I have some sympathy with this. Um, however, I feel at this stage probably the bill um, goes far enough in addressing the problem of high hedges. Although having said that, I keep an open mind and it's a shame really that we haven't or we won't get the opportunity to vote on this amendment before hearing what Stuart Stevenson uh, what Stuart um, Macmillan has to say, because I think crucial to this is the timing of the review, and we'll get to that, that later to make sure that that isn't left too long. If it was left too long, I'd be rather inclined to support the amendment for deciduous um, there. And in terms of Christine Graham's um, uh, amendment, I think it's a very valid point and one I'd be inclined to support. Thank you. Members, Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, convener. I, um, I listened carefully to what uh, Anne McTaggart had to say and was interested in it. Um, I, I do think, however, it was uh, slightly optimistic. I, I noted the phrase uh, that uh, Anne McTaggart used, and one which I associate with, because we, we will all be likely to have had experience, um, where neighbours uh, use any excuse to pursue arguments with each other. Um, and the phrase vindictive in intent is one I certainly recognise. I'm less optimistic, however, uh, that this measure, however narrowly or widely it's drawn, will lead uh, to, to an ending of uh, some of the most, uh, uh, most egregious examples of uh, neighbour disputes. Uh, so I'm not persuaded particularly, uh, therefore, uh, that it, including deciduous will make a substantial difference. I think uh, looking at the English experience where uh, restricting it uh, uh, in a way that excludes deciduous appears to be delivering the kind of value that was sought is likely uh, to be proportionate at this stage. Um, I will uh, wait with interest the debate around uh, Amendment 12 that our colleague Stuart McMillan is bringing forward on the review um, and, and, and I think that uh, that is the right uh, time uh, when we come to that debate to, to think about whether we extend the definition. Um, I would say that uh, light is seasonal just as leaves are seasonal uh, and uh, excluding deciduous which in the generality um, allow more light a bigger proportion of the available light through in the winter uh, as compared to the summer is probably uh, the correct thing to do. Uh, Christine Graham's uh, uh, contribution to the debate was fascinating but not necessarily persuasive. Um, Margaret Mitchell, um, I'm, I'm going to listen carefully to what the member in charge and perhaps the minister has to say before uh, coming to a final conclusion on. I can see where she's coming from. It certainly seems to make sense, um, but I'd like to be assured that this doesn't damage the intent of the Act. And if the debate shows that that's the case, then I, I certainly think that's uh, perfectly supportable. Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, just in terms of the amendments, uh, I'm actually quite glad uh, that 
uh, that, that I think it was the only member uh, in the committee uh, when we were looking through the report stage that actually had some reservations regarding the definition. So it's allowed this debate to actually take place. Uh, and uh, I think members will know uh, sort of my uh, sort of my thoughts uh, regarding uh, the definition. Um, in terms of the, the amendments that we have in front of us, um, I think I'll, I'll deal with Christine Graham's first of all. Uh, I, I'm not too sure that uh, with what Christine is proposing uh, will actually uh, be so encompassing that actually that all uh, all plants will actually be involved. So with that being the case, uh, how many additional houses? will actually be affected. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm certainly seeking a bit of clarification uh, from Christian Graham on that. Um, I, I, don't, I generally don't know how manageable that would actually be. In terms of the, the deciduous, uh, I'm certainly keen to hear what, uh, what the member in charge and but also the minister... I'd like to intervene, because I know I'm not the summing up, because I'm not the first in the group, for just to clarify the question that Stuart McMillan posed. Sure. Okay. Yeah, or fine. just simply to say that plants wouldn't mean all plants, they'd have to fulfil the other criteria, which is to reach that height and to block light. So it couldn't be pansies, for instance, or forget-me-nots, because they don't grow tall enough. <laughs> now, I'm sure you know that. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Mr McMillan. Right. Um, uh, I think that's been, that's been a helpful uh, addition from Christine Graham. <laughs> Um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, the, the deciduous uh, amendment from Anne McTaggart, certainly I'm certainly keen to hear what uh, certainly what the member, uh, the member in charge, and also the minister have to say, um, because uh, uh, I mean, whether, whether that uh, that amendment actually passes today or not, um, obviously it could certainly come back at stage three, of course, uh, if it were to uh, if it were to fall today. But I'm keen to hear actually what the certainly what the minister and the member in charge have to say. In terms of uh, Margaret Mitchell's. Uh, amendment. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I, I generally think that's actually a, a helpful uh, amendment, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm keen to hear certainly once again uh, from the member and the minister. Uh, but uh, I think it actually generally is a helpful amendment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John Wilson, please. Thank you, convener. I think we all wait with interest Christine Graham's uh, appearance on Beechgrove Garden. <laughs> uh, the the issues that the dealing with Christine Graham's amendment when she refers to ivy and uh, other growers, growing plants, clematis, they have to grow against something. So the difficulty is, is then if they're growing against a fence or a tree, then the difficulty is, is what you do to actually deal with that issue is do you then take down the tree uh, or the, the area that they're growing against. So there, there are issues there. In terms of plants, and I know that one of the issues that I'd be concerned about is a particular plant uh, that's a favourite of mine is burley eye which is the, known as the butterfly plant, because of its very nature, uh, encourages butterflies to feed and also uh, lay their eggs. And I know this is getting into technical aspects, but it's about so, something we did discuss and we heard evidence from as a committee from some of the wildlife organisations who clearly indicated a concern if we made this uh, bill too widespread, then it could have an impact on the ecology of particular areas. Uh, there's a mistake there in what if the member Mr. has Wilson said. allows you to, yeah, Mr Wilson. Yeah. Buddleia is a shrub. Yes. So that's within the ambit well, of the Act already. The, the definitions that we'll look at, and I'm sure as the bill goes through and it becomes an Act, there will be many interpretations, and we will leave it to uh, experts in the field to actually in interpret the legislation as it goes through. In terms of Anne McTaggart's amendment, I have serious reservations uh, because of the, the very issue uh, that has been raised on a number of occasions by witnesses uh, if you start including deciduous uh, um, plants or trees in the definition, then that could have an impact. And that brings me on to Margaret Mitchell's amendments. I think the, the reality is, and I think she's correct to point out, we'll await with interest the review periods because I'm sure evidence will come forward in terms of the review period uh, and they will be gathered by local authorities and others to indicate whether or not the Act, when introduced, is successful in dealing with the majority of cases, because I'm sure that uh, the issues raised by Scott Hedge uh, members will clearly uh, give an indication that the majority of issues that they face or their members face will not be addressed by this bill or an act when it comes into being, uh, because they have raised other issues about single trees and uh, other uh, 
problems that may exist uh, in terms of neighbour disputes. Well, this is certainly a horticultural education for me. Sarah Boyack, please. Thank you, Convener. I may not go into quite as much depth as previous colleagues have gone. Um, I suppose I want to go to the heart of the bill, which I think we all support, which is to try and give residents the opportunity of disputes resolution. It doesn't actually automatically mean that those disputes will be satisfied for the people that take those disputes to the local authority, but it at least lets them have their say and at least lets an independent approach actually look at the, the circumstance. And I am concerned that um, following the, the stage one debate, the comments that we had about have we got the definition right, I have had quite a few representations from people who are concerned that because the definition as it stands doesn't include deciduous hedges, that there will be many disputes that will not come within the ambit of the bill. Now, I don't think there are so many disputes that it would undermine the principle behind this legislation. And Scott Hedge's view is of all the many long-term disputes that they are aware of, there are around 20% which could be classified as coming under the Amendment 1 that Anne uh, McTaggart has laid today. So that's around 20%. It doesn't mean that all 20% of those cases, if they were included in the bill, would come to a successful resolution in terms of the people who'd want to take them. But at least they would come within the ambit of the bill. And I suppose my um, reason for supporting Anne is that without changing the bill, then we know where we are now, that there will be many, many people will not get the resolution that this bill was intended to deliver. And the long campaigning that there's been for this bill will leave people profoundly um, unhappy. And disputes will remain, disputes will continue to fester. Um, and there's a, cost in, there's a cost in that. We all know that from representing constituents. The arguments against change seem to me um, need to be weighed against the unintended consequences of not including this. Because if only some types of hedges are addressed, then it leaves people who are required to take down evergreen hedges, it leaves them with the option of putting up deciduous hedges. Mm -hmm. And that then means that we're not just back to where we're starting from, but it's a worse experience because that will be a real kick in the teeth. And that has been mentioned to me as a potential unintended consequence of not acting now. So I think it's not a disproportionate amendment. Um, the evidence from south of the border is not um, that this would lead to huge, huge increases. I think Scott Hedge, as the campaign behind this um, change of legislation, this new legislation, um, have a reasonable estimate in terms of their own cases, and I think that, that should guide us today. I think in terms of a review of this process, if we were to decide not um, to change the bill today and we're to be comforted by the fact, and we can tell our constituents that they should be comforted because there will be a review along in some time. I don't think that's going to give them much comfort because they'll know that even a review two or five years hence basically means that for the next five years there'll be no change. They will have no right to ask somebody to take an objective view of the dispute which has grown up between them and their neighbours and has not got any prospect of resolution. And I think that would be a disappointing end to a bill that I think the member in charge has been right to bring to this parliament. He's put in a huge amount of work and I think the bill could be better and I think this amendment would actually help that process. Thank you, Convener. John Wilson. Convener, it's just, I'm interested in Sarah Byer's comments. Given that this uh, bill in various guises has been to the, before this parliament since almost 1999, uh, we're now at the stage where we're actually now proceeding, hopefully, uh, with a bill that will become an act. Uh, I th think, it, in terms of Sarah Bayer's comments, I think it's interesting that it's taken this long to actually get to the, where we are at the present moment, given that in the previous, in, 2000, in 1999, 2003, 2003, 2007, both Scottish uh, executives actually rejected the bill, uh, and we're now at the stage where we are, where we're proceeding with this bill. So I think it's a bit disingenuous of Sarah about it to come along and say we need to change uh, or amend this bill and this bill has been around in various guises for a long number of years and finally a government has taken this on board and the reason why the minister's here today is to support a bill coming into being. The issue in terms of the numbers, uh, we need to be very careful because we won't know the numbers affected. We get, we get estimates from Scott Hedge and, we, and Anne McTaggart maybe in her summing up can try and put some figures on the 20% uh, that Scott Hedge claim 
uh, will be left out of the, the in terms of neighbour dispute, will be left out if this bill goes ahead in the existing wording and the existing definition. Uh, because really, we, we are looking at numbers here in terms of how many people will be affected. And the issue about uh, vexatious uh, individuals deciding to put in uh, different uh, uh, deciduous hedge, uh, one of the reasons why action was being taken against Leylandi was the, the speed at which Leylandi can grow. We know that deciduous hedging takes a lot longer to grow, and as my colleague uh, said to me earlier, the issue is that the time lapse between planting a deciduous hedge and planting a Leylandi can be many decades, never mind years. So there, there are real issues about whether or not uh, we actually include deciduous in the definition, and I, as I said, I'm minded not to include the deciduous at the present time until we get uh, an, an opportunity to review. I mean, I, I do accept the fact this Parliament hasn't legislated on it, and I think it is because it's a tricky issue, and I think it was it never got high on high enough off the agenda um, for it to be supported. I think that's why we should seize the day and and try and get it right at this point. I take John's point that this is our first chance to do that, but that's not an argument against Anne McTaggart's amendment. It's, it's a good political argument, but it's not actually a technical argument against what she's proposing today. Uh, Convener, if you want to go into technical debate on the issue, the 10-year delay in actually bringing this bill forward has meant that some of the land I have grown 20 feet and more. Uh, so the reality is, is that the, in terms of the review period, then the review period in terms of deciduous trees or bushes would then allow us, if it's, the review period was within two to five year time period, it's certainly a lot less than it's taken us to get to the stage we're at at the present moment. And certainly, as, as, uh, as we've said, with the deciduous trees or uh, bushes, it would take a lot longer to reach 30 feet. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I'm happy to uh, continue the, the government's support uh, for the bill. I think John Wilson's correct that uh, we should take this opportunity to get it right, and Sarah Boyack's also correct that with the lack of legislation, we start with a blank page, and that's all the more reason that we take um, the most uh, consensually based approach that we can. I meant one from Anne McTaggart, uh, supported by Christian Graham, proposes widening the definition of a high hedge to include deciduous trees and shrubs. Amendment 2 from Christine Graham proposes extending the definition of a high hedge beyond trees and shrubs to include all plants. I said at stage 1 that in terms of the definition, the government has taken quite a relaxed view on that. We have given evidence and given our position, but have said that we will listen to what Parliament thinks is the appropriate way forward. I went on to say that if we were to propose changing the definition substantially at this point, I would want to return to local government <coughs> to consult it. Given that Amendments 1 and 2 now propose such a change, I have written to local authorities to seek their views on the potential impact of widening the definition of a high hedge in the ways proposed. Whilst it is not possible to obtain local authority views in time to inform our discussions today, I have asked them for a response in good time for Stage 3, where we can revisit the issue so that the issue can be properly considered then, in light of those views. I would hope that the committee agrees that this is a sensible approach to take in this instance, given that the bill imposes new obligations on local authorities. We are sympathetic to the desire to capture as many reasonable cases as possible, but I would not want to preempt local government. I would therefore ask Anne McTaggart to withdraw her amendment and Christine Graham not to move her amendment and not press this issue until we have had those views. Finally, Amendment 19, sorry, Amendment 19 from Margaret Mitchell also relates to the Bill's definition of a high hedge. It appears to respond to the Committee's concerns about the clarity of the powers provided by Section 34 to alter that definition. The Government's view is that Section 34 does not require to be amended. A view is that it is clear that the modifying powers provided by Section 34 could only be used to modify the meaning of a high hedge within the context of the Bill. However, the Government accepts that this amendment may help address some of the concerns raised at Stage 1 and does not therefore oppose Amendment 19 in the context of the Bill. Uh, it, therefore, the Government are prepared to support Amendment 19. MacDonald. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, uh, and I'm grateful to the members who have laid amendments and allowed us to have uh, some discussion and debate today. Um, 
The amendment from Anne McTaggart obviously seeks to widen the meaning of, of high hedge beyond evergreen and semi-evergreen trees and shrubs and would include deciduous species. Um, an amendment too from Christine Graham would broaden the definition beyond trees and shrubs, including plants. Um, the amendment from Margaret Mitchell seeks to clarify uh, the, the extent to which Section 34 can be used to modify the meaning of high hedge, and I know that's an issue that members had raised at stage one. Uh, in terms of Amendment 1, uh, I personally have, have been convinced uh, during this process that evergreen and semi-evergreen trees and shrubs are the main problem, and I think the figures do bear out that that is the main problem. However, during the process, I have heard from other members uh, and also received uh, significant levels of correspondence and representations from members of the public. Uh, many are happy with the current definition because they believe it will solve their problem, but I also accept that some, remain, some others remain for whom the bill will not solve their own high hedge problem. And obviously, by definition, those people who find themselves least happy with uh, a proposed piece of legislation are those most likely to contact members uh, in relation to that legislation. Um, in terms of Amendment 2, I, I think that there, this would be a significant broadening of the bill. Uh, I think it would cause problems in terms of how it might be understood and interpreted, and I think there is the potential for loopholes and inconsistencies to emerge. Um, I, I believe that we would, require, we would require the views of the experts who would implement the legislation, and of course the committee did hear from a number of experts in the field uh, in uh, the process of stage one. In terms of the comments around Ivy, and I, I took John Wilson's point with interest, obviously if you were to set ivy against a fence and it were to reach the height required for the bill to come into effect, that fence in and of itself would require planning permission and therefore the planning process would be involved in that process as well. But I am happy to learn that the government has written to local authorities to consult with them uh, on the potential impact of these amendments. I think it's important for uh, all of us to consider their response before reaching a conclusion on this issue, uh, as they are the bodies that will have to implement the provisions. Um, so I would ask, therefore, that we uh, should revisit this issue at stage three, and would request Anne McTaggart withdraw amendment number one uh, and ask Christine Graham not to move amendment number two. I am continuing to consider all aspects of this issue and I would be happy to have further discussions with both members uh, on this matter uh, following stage two. Uh, in terms of Amendment 19, uh, I, I set out my view on Section 34 at stage one and in my written response to the committee's stage one report. Uh, I made clear my response uh, and also my parallel letter to the subordinate legislation committee that I did not intend to lay an amendment in respect of Section 34. Uh, I remain of the view that the section is drafted as clear an amendment is not necessary. But the clarification sought by committee, uh, while I believe it could be provided by the way of explanatory notes, I don't intend to oppose Margaret Mitchell's amendment, uh, and certainly the view of committee members is that it's a helpful amendment, so uh, I would be happy enough uh, for the committee to accept Amendment 19 from Margaret Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, can I call on Anne McTaggart to wind up and press her withdrawal? Thanks, convener. Um, having heard the minister and the member in charge, I welcome the, the further consultation with the local authorities and obviously to ask for the expert advice and it's hugely important that, that we receive that. Um, however, I'm still unclear as to... Are we able then to get back to you before stage three at ISIS? Is that a possibility? That's the acknowledgement from the Minister. Yes. Well, with the understanding that, that that would be happening, I would be willing to withdraw the amendment at this stage to consult with um, the member in charge and with the minister before yeah. stage three arrives. So, uh, Ms McTaggart has said that she will withdraw. Uh, is there any member opposed to that? No. In which case, amendment one is withdrawn. Uh, can I call uh, the, the amendment in the name of Christine Graham, already debated with Amendment 1. Christine Graham, to move or not move? Uh, given the, the Minister's um, undertaking the member in charge that this will all be examined prior to Stage 3, including cultural advice, which I think is very relevant here, if I may say, because you can put ivy up chicken netting and posts, and that's not a fence that requires planning permission. I just put that on the record for them, but any further advice I'll do after the meeting, uh, I will not press and I will not move this amendment. So that amendment is not moved. Uh, if I could move on. Okay. Uh, 
the question uh, is that section one be agreed to. No, that comes, that comes later, sorry. Um, the question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, the question is that sections two and three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, Section 4, uh, refund of application fee. Can I call Amendment 13 in the name of Mar Margaret Mitchell, group with Amendment 16? Margaret Mitchell, could you move Amendment 13 and speak to other amendments in the group, please? Um, so moved, um, convener. This amendment requires local authorities to publish guidance on the circumstances it would normally um, consider or they would normally consider it appropriate to make a refund under Section 4. At present, it's within the local authorities' absolute discretion whether or not to issue a refund to an applicant under Section 4. And in the interests of certainty and, and to ensure that refunds are awarded or not awarded consistently, I think it would be highly desirable that Council should publish guidance stating in what circumstances they may normally consider it appropriate to issue these refunds. This will still leave um, Councils with some discretion but it will ensure that applicants know when they can or should receive a refund for their application fee. The amendment also requires local authorities to consider any guidance issued by uh, ministers on when it may be appropriate or desirable to issue refunds under Section 4 should the government um, decide to issue such guidelines under its power to issue guidelines on the legislation which is contained in Section 31. S amendment 16, this amendment allows local authorities to recover the amount of any applicant fee refunded to an applicant from a hedge owner when the exercise of their power under Section 22 to enter and enforce a high hedge notice has been effected. Under Section 25, councils can recover, amongst other things, any expenses reasonably incurred in taking action under Section 22, which allows them to enter land and enforce high hedges notices. However, there's currently no provision under Section 25 to allow councils to recover the applicant's application fee from a high hedge owners where a refund has been given. And this amendment therefore expressly gives the power to councils but only where they have to enforce a high head no notice themselves. As a matter of principle, I think it's reasonable that where, high, uh, where hedge owners have been obs obstinate or persistently stubborn in complying with a high hedge notice, causing unnecessary additional distress and frustration to neighbours, and requiring councils to have to enter the land and to do the work themselves, it is appropriate that the applicant should be able to um, be refunded their application fee and the hedge owner charged. Furthermore, this threat of an addi additional cost if a high hedge order is not implemented um, is a valuable additional tool to encourage quick, um, swift compliance with decisions. Thank you. Uh, members, Stuart Stevenson, please. Um, just a, a little technical point about um, Margaret Mitchell's Amendment 16. I, I'm just slightly uncertain why it is necessary only for the Council to recover the money when it's been refunded to the applicant. And I just wondered whether the member might care. I'm sympathetic to what the member is seeking to achieve. Um, but, but I just wondered why it was necessary for the money actually to have been refunded for the council to uh, be able to, in, in the terms uh, that uh, in subsection one, a relevant local authority may recover from any person. Uh, in other words, it seems to me that the member's intention is to be able to retain the money as well as recovering it when it hasn't been refunded and to, to apply it. And it may be that I'm misunderstanding so in our summing up perhaps the member could uh, 
address that point, to which I'm broadly sympathetic, the intention anyway. If the member wants to intervene at this moment in the convener allows. Uh, 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 Ms Mitchell, you can address that point now. Thank you very much, convener. Clearly, if um, the application fee has been paid, then the council has received that money. If the council has refunded the application fee money to the applicant, the council is out of pocket for that amount. And what the amendment seeks to do is to allow the council to recoup that if um, the owner is not complying and being obstinate and the council ha has to actually go in and do the work itself. Um, convener, I may be making a mountain out of a molehill. The circumstance I envisage is where the council has determined that the correct circumstances for refund exist, but has not yet exercised its right exercise that refund, the circumstances that are sought to be caught of entry to the grounds do exist, but in other parts of the Act, the requirement to refund exists. So therefore, I'm simply concerned that, that there isn't a little gap in the provision being. It, this is a matter that we could, I would be comfortable were we to accept this today, subject to what the member in charge and the minister say, um, but I suspect we may have to look at it further to make sure we're not creating a wee gap which might minima uh, reduce the effect that's intended. I I'll consider the matter further. The member may Any wish other to members wish to come in here? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Wilson, please. Yeah, uh, just in terms of Amendment 16, if Margaret Mitchell in her summing up could clarify how her amendment differs from Section A and Section B, the rest of Section B, in relation to local authority recovery of expenses uh, and how her amendment uh, materially uh, alters uh, the, the existing uh, Section A and the existing Section B, because in Section A it does say any expenses reasonably incurred by the authority in taking action under Section 22. So it's really just to seek clarification on what uh, difference her amendment would make to what is already in the bill uh, and the powers to local authorities to recover any costs associated with action taken by the local authority, which I would assume would include uh, the recovery of any uh, repayment of any fees uh, originally charged. Any other members? Minister? Uh, thank you, Convener. Amendment 13 seeks to require local authorities to publish information on the circumstances in which application fees for high hedge notices will be refunded and requires authorities to have regard to any guidance issued by ministers on the matter. I think this is a helpful addition to the Bill's provisions, and the Government is happy to support Amendment 13. Amendment 16 would enable hedge owners to be charged any amount of an application fee for a high hedge notice, which a local authority had decided to refund to an applicant. During the Stage 1 debate, I said that we are interested to hear the Committee's views, but were content with the current position. I also noted then that there may be specific issues about fairness in that. Having taken appropriate action, someone might still be charged. Excuse me. I also think it's clear from the experience in England and Wales uh, is that the system where the applicant pays the fee works well and serves as a deterrent. For these reasons, I would urge the committee to oppose Amendment 16. Mark, McMillan, uh, Mark uh, Macdonald will go into greater debt. And the Government therefore supports Amendment 13 but opposes Amendment 16. Mr Macdonald, please. Thank you, Convener. We appear to be on a rotational surname basis this morning, <laughs> having, having had Stuart Macmillan incorrectly identified as Stuart Stevenson earlier in the day. Um, I agree with Margaret Mitchell that transparency over issues related to fees is important, and I'm therefore grateful to her for proposing Amendment 13, uh, which I think is helpful, and I'm happy to encourage the Committee to support that amendment. Turning to Amendment 16, <clears throat> the purpose of this amendment appears to be to enable a form of fee transfer mechanism akin to that operating in Northern Ireland. I said during stage one that I had issues about the effectiveness of such a provision, local authorities pot potentially pursuing hedge owners for small amounts even after they have complied with a high hedge notice. Now, I note Ms Mitchell talks about this in terms of those uh, hedge owners who are obstinate, stubborn uh, and do not comply with a notice. Uh, firstly, the amendment makes no reference to that. Uh, I would assume that Ms Mitchell would be hoping for that to be reflected in 
guidance, but also uh, the evidence quite clearly demonstrates from those lo local authorities south of the border that there's only ever been one example that we can find uh, in all of the time that the legislation has been in place uh, where an action has had to be taken by a local authority. Therefore, I would question uh, in terms of the scale uh, of the problem that Ms Mitchell would be seeking to address. Uh, it remains in my view that uh, when a high hedge notice has been issued and the owner of the hedge has complied at their own expense, it seems neither fair nor cost effective for the local authority to then send them a bill for an amount originally paid by the applicant. It's important to remember, convener, that this bill is not about punishing owners of high hedges. This bill is about resolving disputes between individuals, and I believe that this amendment perhaps errs too far towards the punishment rather than the dispute resolution. However, I, I know we will be discussing a, a later on Amendment 12, which seeks to insert a review clause. Without wishing to prejudge what the committee might decide, I would consider that this is the sort of issue that might be better encapsulated as part of a review, particularly as we might then be in a better position to, work, to assess how effective such a provision has been in Northern Ireland, where it is still very much in its infancy. So for those reasons, uh, while I'm happy to support Amendment 13, I would urge the committee to oppose Amendment 16. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Mitchell to wind up and press or withdraw, please. Yes, um, thank you, convener. Um, obviously, pressing 13, and um, I welcome the comments, and hopefully this will improve the, the bill in, in um, adding some certainty and consistency to the guidance thereafter. Uh, in terms of the refund of the fee, I think, you know, in, in response to Stuart um, Stevenson's point, it's all uh, an issue of timing and um, the gap to which he refers um, may, um, may actually come into being depending on how long it takes for the uh, council to in and have to do the work. The refund has been paid. Obviously, if the refund hasn't been paid and hasn't been refunded, there isn't an issue there at all. In terms of what the Minister and Mark MacDonald have said, um, under, oh sorry, John Wilson first, under section 22, Two, then the refund, um, all the all the refunds for the, the work undertaken by the lo local authority and having to go in, yes, are covered under Section 22. Except the application fee is is a separate issue. That's you know the beginning of the process. Later on, my understanding is that Section 22 is all to do with what the the council has to do in order to make good the notice if the applicant is being obstinate. I do, however, take on board what um, the member says about um, obstinate and um, just spelling out that uh, that particular circumstance is being um, in the amendment. Uh, I don't necessarily agree that it's over um, punitive, but I think it may help com compliance. But um, for the, the reasons stated, then I'm happy to reflect on the comments and not press at this stage and perhaps bring it back at stage three, should I still consider that there's medit in doing so. So, thank you very much. So, the question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Um, section 5 is the dismissal of application. Can I call Amendment 14 in the name of Margaret Mitchell in a group in its own? Uh, Mrs Mitchell, would you like to speak and move Thank your you, amendment, please? Yeah, move the amendment. This amendment amends Section 5 of the bill by adding to the reasons for dismissal of a high head notice application. Under Section 5, an application for a high hedge notice can be dismiss dismissed if it's considered that the applicant has not comp complied with the pre-application requirements under Section 3 or if the application is frivolous or vexatious. However, some applications which are without merit might not fall into the categories in Section 5 because they might not be frivolous, i.e. not a serious application, or vexatious, raised habitually or persistently without reasonable grounds. So this amendment seeks to ensure that applications which are neither frivolous or nor vexatious but are without merit can be rejected under Section 5. Yes, certainly. Um, I wonder if the member could give an example of an application that would be caught by her provision of being without merit. 
Well, I don't think I can off the, the cuff um, <laughs> uh, just now, but what I can tell you is that there is precedent for this kind of definition being looked at and expanded upon in terms of the Legal Profession and Legal Aid Scotland Act 2007, Section 24, for adding without merit as a separate reason for dismissal of a complaint. And I think the, cons the, the bill would be improved if this precedent was followed here. I would need some time to have a think of what would actually be without merit as opposed to frivolous or vexatious. I mean, clearly a one-off isn't habitually, so that's the vexatious out. Frivolous, um, well, that to an extent is, is um, subjective perhaps, and um, without merit maybe helps um, add to the definition, convener. Thank you. Members? No. Nope. Minister? The Scottish Government does not support Amendment 14. The balance for sifting applications for a high hedge notice is appropriately struck by Section 5 in the Bill as introduced. That provides appropriate provision as regards dismissing applications at a preliminary stage without requiring the local authority to investigate further. I expect Mark MacDonald to give further analysis of the issue and if Margaret Mitchell is persuaded by that, I would ask her to withdraw her amendment, but government is content with the existing provisions. Mr MacDonald, please. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, amendment 14 is similar to an amendment suggested by the Law Society of Scotland. <clears throat> I, I was very happy to meet the Society ahead of Stage 2, and I'm very grateful to them for the interest they've taken in the Bill. Uh, when we met, the Society suggested that it would be helpful to add totally without merit to frivolous or vexatious as an additional reason why a local authority might dismiss an application. Uh, having now had the opportunity to consider this proposal, my view is that such amendments are not necessary. Uh, in my view, frivolous already covers cases which are totally without merit. Section 5 of the Bill is drafted in the same manner to many other similar examples in Scottish Acts, giving the opportunity to the local authority to sift out, at a preliminary stage, claims which do not deserve a full consideration. Uh, frivolous or totally without merit gives a low threshold for applicants to overcome. Uh, Amendment 14, however, suggests summary dismissal where the case is without merit rather than totally without merit. Uh, I'm concerned that introduces a much higher hurdle for applicants to cross before the case is considered on its merits under Section 6. Uh, Section 5 separately allows the application to be dismissed at this stage where the applicant has not complied with the pre-application requirements. Uh, I believe the balance is appropriately struck by Section 5 as it stands. For these reasons, I would ask Margaret Mitchell to withdraw the amendment, and if she is not minded to do so, I would ask the committee to vote against it. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Margaret Mitchell to wind up and press her withdrawal, please? Thank you very much, convener. In many ways, this is um, a bit of a probing amendment. It's been very useful to hear the comments um, and to realise that an example of what would be without merit, not covered by the, others, uh, the other two definitions, would help see if this is actually necessary. So I'm happy to withdraw at this stage and look at it again and see if there's merit in bringing it forward in stage, at stage are the committee content with withdrawal of that amendment? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the question is that section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, section 6 covers the procedure and applications and notices where hedges situated uh, in national parks. Can I call amendment 3 in the name of Mark MacDonald, grouped with amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7. Uh, Mark MacDonald, could you move Amendment 3 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, Convener, and I, I move Amendment 3 uh, and we'll speak to that <coughs> amendment and all other amendments. Uh, amendments 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 relate to hedges within the boundary of a national park. Uh, in its written submission to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park Authority proposed that national park authorities should be statutory consultees in relation to high hedge notices relating to hedges within their areas. Uh, their proposal was supported by the Scottish Scottish Tree Officers Group. I'm grateful to the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park Authority for raising this issue. Uh, and as I said during the Stage 1 debate on the bill, I'm happy to agree with the Local Government and Regeneration Committee's recommendation that the relevant National Park Authority should be a statutory consultee when a local authority is considering issuing a high hedge notice relating to a hedge within the area of a national park. Uh, Amendment 3 ensures that National Park Authorities will be consulted in relation to such hedges 
and their representations taken into account by local authorities in considering whether any action should be taken to address the ad adverse effect of a high hedge. Uh, amendments 4, 5 and 6 ensure that national park authorities will be informed of the outcome of local authorities' decisions in relation to such hedges and provided with a copy of any newly issued or varied high hedge notices as well as where a notice is withdrawn. And Amendment 7 is consequential on Amendment 6 and ensures that the new consultation requirement applies to any withdrawal or variation of a revised high hedge notice. Thank you. Members, Stuart Stevenson, please. Um, just a very simple point, uh, Kimbina. I wonder if the member uh, who's moving this um, uh, amendment might assure us uh, that he's considered whether this adequately covers the issue uh, where the high hedge is on ground that is owned and or controlled by a National Park Authority. Mr Macdonald can deal with that just well, now if he wishes. I'll save it for my summing up if okay. that's okay. Any other members? Minister? Okay, the Government is happy to support Amendments 3, 4, 5 and 6 and 7 from Mark Macdonald. They're not totally without merit. In fact, we support them. Uh, the Government agrees that these amendments are a useful addition and respond to concerns raised in the written evidence at Stage 1. It is right the relevant National Park Authority should be notified of decisions which affect high hedges situated in land within their area and being able to make representations in relation to those decisions. Thank you. Mr Macdonald, would you like to uh, wind up please and press your withdrawal? <coughs> yes, Convener. In response to Stuart Stevenson's point, obviously there is a similar consideration to be had where a local authority owns the land and would be adjudicating on itself. And I believe that the, the conflict of interest test that applies there and the committee is satisfied with would equally apply in these circumstances. And even in any, in, in any case where, where there to be a consideration that that conflict of interest had caused an issue, there is obviously the right of appeal which exists as well. So I believe that uh, the safeguards that Mr Stevenson had raised uh, are factored in. I'll take a brief intervention. Um, it, can the member also confirm, of course, that the National Park is not a decision maker in this matter, merely a consultee? Absolutely happy to confirm that. The decision rests with the local authority. The National Park is merely included here as a consultee. And you press, I that, press amendment. that amendment. Okay. Uh, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. The question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 4 in the name of Mark MacDonald, already debated but with Amendment 3. Uh, Mark MacDonald, move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, the question is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, section 8, can I call Amendment 5 in the name of Mark MacDonald, already debated with Amendment 3. Mr MacDonald, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Uh, the question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. If we move on to Section 10, can I call Amendment 6 in the name of Mark MacDonald, already debated with Amendment 3? Mr MacDonald, move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 7 in the name of Mark MacDonald, already debated with Amendment 3? Mr MacDonald, move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Uh, the question is that Section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Sections 11 to 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Um, section 15, uh, can I call Amendment 15 in the name of Margaret Mitchell in a group on its own? Uh, Margaret Mitchell to move and speak to the amendment, please. All right. Amendment so moved, convener. Section 15 empowers Scottish ministers to appoint a person to determine an appeal under Section 12. This, gi this gives guidance on what kind of person the minister should appoint. The rights of appeal contained in the Bill are of considerable uh, importance to applicants. Any appeal must therefore be determined by 
properly qualified persons who are trained in the law and have adequate experience of dealing with disputes and hearing uh, appeals. And what this amendment seeks to do, quite simply, is to ensure the person appointed by the ministers has these qualifications before hearing an appeal. Thank you. Member Stuart Stevenson. Um, I, I wonder if the member in her summing up, or, or now if she wishes, um, could perhaps indicate how many people in Scotland might meet what appears to be a very specific uh, set of requirements, for example, experience of hearing and deciding appeals, coupled with land boundary disputes, and a knowledge of the law. It seems extremely uh, constraining, and I'd be very interested uh, in, in helping come to a conclusion in relation to this amendment um, if, if uh, an indication of how many people might meet such a test. Want to give that indication now or in your summing up? I think um, Stuart Stevenson um, knows he's asking the impossible, but I think it's entirely reasonable that we look at people with necessary experience, either through their experience in, in planning and horticultural, in a, a number of different fields, it would not be impossible to get people with the, the relevant experience as indicated in the amendment. Uh, I'll consider the rest of the debate. Uh, Thank you, Mr Stevenson. Any other member? Minister? I'm just reflecting, convener, that possibly the only person I know that's uh, qualified to cover all three areas is the member that's left, Christine Graham, <laughs> in terms of the law, horticulture. And I'm not sure about her planning prowess, but she did touch on that in her contribution as well. Uh, I suspect she's the exception, not the norm. Um, now back to my briefing notes. Um, <laughs> Amendment 15 relates to the knowledge and experience of those appointed by ministers to undertake appeals on high hedges. The Government intends that the Directorate for Planning and Environmental Appeals, the DPEA, will deal with such appeals. They, of course, have considerable experience of dealing with planning and other appeals, yet I know that there are no statutory requirements under planning law setting out required knowledge or experience for dealing with planning appeals. It is therefore unnecessary and it would be disproportionate to impose those requirements in relation to high hedge appeals. It, this is something we should seek to avoid. All necessary guidance, of course, and professionalism would be in place. This amendment is unnecessary, not proportionate, and I would urge the committee to resist it for the reasons given. And Mark MacDonald will explain further. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, amendment 15 by Margaret Mitchell seeks to require a person appointed by ministers will have uh, specific knowledge of Scots law and experience of certain specified matters. Um, while I agree with Margaret Mitchell that persons appointed to deal with the appeals process should have appropriate experience, I believe that's already covered by uh, appeals being dealt with on behalf of ministers by the Directorate for Planning and Environmental Appeals, uh, who will appoint a reporter to deal with each individual case. The Directorate's reporters already deal with planning appeals, which can of course be massively complex, and the impact of developments under such appeals are often enormous, certainly far more reaching uh, than a dispute between neighbours over a high hedge. All of the Directorate's reporters are experienced in dealing with many types of analogous cases. They have the relevant knowledge and experience, and I don't believe there is any need to impose a statutory requirement. Indeed, there is uh, no statutory requirement relating to the knowledge and experience of reporters who are considering planning appeals. I would therefore suggest to the committee that it would be disproportionate to impose such requirements in respect of those dealing with high hedge appeals. Uh, furthermore, I note the amendment would require those appointing appointed to deal with appeals to appear to ministers to have knowledge of the law of Scotland. Presumably some legal qualification would be required to demonstrate that. However, reporters dealing with the much more complex landscape of planning law do not usually have legal qualifications, rather they are normally professional town planners. It would therefore be odd to potentially exclude them from dealing with high hedge appeals. And finally, imposing these requirements could raise a risk of challenge on procedural rather than substantive grounds on the basis that it is questioned whether the person hearing the appeal had the specified knowledge or experience. And on that basis, I would urge the committee to resist Amendment 15. 
Mr Macdonald. Uh, Mrs Mitchell, to okay. sum up and press or withdraw, please. Thank you, Convener. Again, this is a, a probing amendment. I think that's been useful, the, the comments that have been given. I think there still is an important issue here, so I don't dismiss it entirely as the uh, Minister and the member in charge appears to, to, to have done this morning. But I shall reflect on the comment and see if the amendment can be improved in such a way to address what I think is still an issue in ensuring that a properly qualified or experienced person is actually put in charge of the appeal. So, not press, convener. Thank you. Uh, are the committee content with the withdrawal of that amendment? Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is that section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, agreed. The question is that s section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, section 17 is minor and technical amendments. Can I call Amendment 8 in the name of Mark MacDonald, grouped with Amendments 9, 10 and 11? Uh, Mr MacDonald, can you move uh, Amendment 8 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, amendments 8 and 9... Oh, sorry, I form, I'll move Amendment 8 at the beginning. Uh, amendments 8 and 9 are minor technical amendments uh, which ensure consistency in the terminology used in Sections 10, 16, 17 uh, and Sections 20 and 23, respectively. Amendments 10 and 11 are also minor technical amendments to sections 26 and 29 of the bill dealing with the registration of notices in the Register of Seizings. Uh, the Register of Seizings includes all properties which have changed hands since 1617. However, a very small number of properties are likely to be unregistered, for example, properties owned by Scotland's ancient universities. Uh, the amendments are technical changes following discussion with Registers of Scotland. They remove the general requirement in relation to notices to be recorded in the General Register of Seizings to identify land by reference to a deed recorded in the General Register of Seasons as some property exists that has not been registered. Uh, the amendments also ensure that notices of liability and discharge can be registered in the General Register of Seasons in respect of land containing a high hedge where that land is part of a larger property, the title to which larger land is recorded in the General Register of Seasons. Thank you, Mr MacDonald. Members? No, Minister? Amendments 8, 9, 10 and 11 are minor technical amendments. The Government agrees that it is helpful for Amendments 8 and 9 to ensure that the wording of Sections 10, 16 and 17 and Sections 20 and 23 are made consistent. The Government also agrees that the Bill should make provision to enable notices of liability of expenses and notices of discharge to be recorded in the General Register of Seasons in relation to properties which have not changed hands since the time of the Act of Union. The Government is therefore happy to agree with Amendment 10 and with the clarification provided by Amendment 11 in relation to larger plots of land. Mr MacDonald, do you want to sum up and press or withdraw? I'll simply press Amendment 8. Convenient. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? The question is that Sections 18 and 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Uh, if we move on to Section 20, uh, can I call Amendment 9 in the name of Mark MacDonald, already debated with Amendment 8? Uh, Mr MacDonald, move or not move? Moved. Uh, moved. The question is that amend Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? The question is that Section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? The question is that Sections 21 to 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 16 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, already debated with Amendment 13. Uh, Mrs Mitchell, move or not move? Moved. Um, not moved, sorry. Um, that's one that withdrew, wasn't it? I, uh, that one is being withdrawn. Are folk content with that being withdrawn? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the question is now that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you. Section 26, can I call Amendment 10 in the name of Mark MacDonald, already debated with Amendment 8? Move or not move, Mr MacDonald? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. The question is that Section 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that Sections 27 and 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you. Section 29, can I call Amendment 11 in the name of Mr MacDonald, already debated with Amendment 8? Mr MacDonald, move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. 
The question is that section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Uh, section 31, uh, consultation before issuing guidance. Can I call amendment 17 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, uh, group with amendment 18. Uh, would you like to... Move, your move Amendment 17 um, and talk to both amendments. Uh, both these amendments, 17 and 18, um, require Scottish ministers to consult on guidance which they will issue under Section 31. Section 1, uh, 31 of the Bill will enable Scottish ministers to issue guidance about the Act. Any guidance that these ministers issue will have an impact on the way which property owners, local authorities, solicitors, and advisers in the high hedge disputes and persons, appoint, and persons appointed to hear appeals will interpret the legislation. Given this, the guidance will be very important and should be consulted upon widely prior to publication so that stakeholders can comment on what is proposed. So both these amendments will ensure that um, such consultation will take place. Thank you, members. Minister. Amendment 17 places an obligation on the Government to consult relevant persons before issuing any guidance on the Act. That is our normal practice for such guidance to ensure that the proper professionals are consulted and that the guidance is as informed as it can be and so would not regard the amendment as strictly necessary. However, given that it is our usual practice, the Government has no strong objections to the Bill placing that requirement on Government. The Government is therefore happy to support Amendment 17 and Amendment 18, which places a similar obligation on local authorities. Mr MacDonald. Uh, like the Minister Convener, I have no strong objections to either of these amendments uh, and am therefore happy to support both amendments. Thank you. Uh, Mrs Mitchell, would you like to sum up and press your uh, withdrawal? Thank you, Convener. Thank the Minister and the Member in charge for the comments and happy to press the amendment. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Can I call Amendment 18 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, already debated with uh, Amendment 17, to move or not move, Mrs Moved. Mitchell? Convenient. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Um, report and operation of the Act. Can I call Amendment 12? in the name of Stuart Macmillan and a group on its own. Uh, Mr Macmillan, uh, would you uh, please move and speak to your amendment, please? Okay, thank you, Convener. First of all, I'll move uh, the amendment to number 12. And in terms of uh, this amendment, it's uh, a, new, uh, a new section to be added in to the bill. Um, as committee members uh, uh, will know, that also the committee agreed in principle to actually have a review in our Stage 1 uh, report. Uh, and also that was discussed at the Stage 1 debate in the chamber as well. Um, at the time, uh, the committee had suggested uh, a time of no, uh, no more than five years, uh, which uh, I mean, we were quite unanimous in that, uh, going through the, the, the scrutiny process. Um, so this, uh, well, furthermore, um, so, I mean, the committee were actually uh, very keen to make sure that, uh, uh, that any review uh, process that took place uh, for this particular piece of legislation was something that was going to be measured uh, going ahead and also uh, that, uh, that, we can't, uh, that the committee certainly couldn't be too prescriptive upon uh, future actions of whether it would be the government or a committee uh, in, in a future uh, parliament. Now, the difference between uh, our review, well, our suggestion uh, in the Stage 1 report uh, as compared to this amendment is that uh, uh, I, uh, putting forward this amendment, I, I think it's actually better uh, to actually have uh, the committee or a subcommittee of the Parliament undertake a review in the future as compared to the government. I think with that being the case, that uh, you, you potentially have actually kind of a wider review and also it would be very much kind of a cross-party uh, operation as compared to uh, from the government of the day, uh, whoever uh, that obviously may be. Um, so I, I do think that, uh, that having the review um, so from uh, kind of a, a wider review, uh, sort of from, from kind of more people, i.e. a committee or a subcommittee, would certainly be uh, beneficial. Um, Furthermore, the, review, uh, the, view, the purpose of the review is certainly to examine uh, whether the Act actually is operating as it should. And certainly the review, uh, I would imagine, certainly would, uh, would provide um, kind of the opportunity for uh, outside interests, uh, once again, to actually have their say as to whether they think the Act actually is uh, fully operational or not, and whether it actually is doing as it really should be. 
uh, in helping uh, our constituents and uh, our communities within Scotland. Uh, there's a, another reason for actually uh, putting forward uh, this amendment, uh, uh, this additional uh, piece uh, into the bill, is that uh, one, of the, one of the issues that's been raised time and time again uh, within the Parliament is, has been the, the, the lack of post-legislative scrutiny. And having this uh, review written into the bill would certainly allow that to, to happen. I mean, there is no criticism on parliamentarians, on governments, uh, on, on the parliament in terms of a lack of post ledge scrutiny. It's just that due to time constraints, and we all fully appreciate that. But actually having this written into the bill ensures that this bill will not actually drop off the political agenda, or so that this act won't drop off the agenda, and that this act will certainly come back to the parliament in the future. And so with that being the case, I am happy to move amendment number 12. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, very much support. Uh, the amendment in Stuart Macmillan's name. I, I'd like to inquire, and perhaps the member can um, comment in his summing up, and indeed Minister and member may comment. Um, the amendment makes no provision for a minimum period for the review. Um, and I, I simply wonder whether uh, it would be appropriate to consider a minimum period so that there is sufficient evidence of the operation of the Act um, for, for, for the review to be meaningful. Um, the absence of that is not going to cause me to uh, consider that I should not support this amendment, but I, I, th I think it's a matter we might consider further. Well, 2B of the amendment covered that, but Mr. Uh, okay. McMillan? Uh, well, I'm happy to take that in the summing up. If that's okay. Okay. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, please. I, I'd be grateful to Stuart McMillan if he could um, clarify Potentially, does this amendment mean that it could be six and a half years after um, the implementation of the Act before the report was forthcoming and the review was available? John Wilson, please. Convener, just be, I welcome the amendment by Stuart McMillan. I, however, while I agree uh, with the substance of the amendment is to make sure there is parliamentary scrutiny of the Act, I would hope then put, put this on record that the government ministers would keep the Act under constant review uh, to assess the, uh, the importance or the effect of the Act as it runs through its course uh, after it's been introduced as legislation, particularly in relation to the earlier discussion that we had as convener regarding the <coughs> issuing of guidance to local authorities and others who may be implementing the Act on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, uh, any decision by a committee to incorporate into any legislation a review period does not take away uh, the responsibility of the government to keep any legislation under constant review and update when appropriate. Thank you. Any other members? No. Minister? Thank you, Convener. Uh, to answer Mr Wilson's point um, straight off, I think he's uh, absolutely correct. It is the duty of any government, indeed any parliamentarian, to monitor the impact of legislation and if other actions required it should be taken in good time. This, I suppose, is a device uh, to uh, reflect on the views of uh, members of the committee uh, and others to ensure that we get the definition right in other matters and if we don't to be able to um, return to that. In terms of timescales, it's entirely a matter for the a committee, I think we just have to be pragmatic about that. But the committee wouldn't want to be bound by a timescale in which you had no flexibility, I would imagine. It's also without precedent that we consider this amendment, because I don't think post-legislative scrutiny, having said what I've just said, is necessary for every piece of legislation we produce as parliamentarians. If we were to do that, it suggests we don't have confidence in the legislation we are considering and then uh, passing. But it is important we get it right. We've already discussed this morning our uh, view to return to stage three in terms of definition uh, and, and those issues. So the amendment 12 from Stuart McMillan responds to the committee's recommendation that a review a provision be included in the bill. And while I do not believe that a mandatory review provision is a necessary feature of the legislation, I note the committee's recommendation on this matter and I'm aware that Mark McDonald has indicated he will support such an amendment. So in these circumstances, the government is prepared to support Amendment 12 from Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Mr McDonald, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment 12 obviously uh, requires a review of the operation of the legislation to be undertaken no later than five years 
uh, after the substantive provisions are commenced uh, or earlier if Parliament dis so decides and I think that's important to state on the record that five years uh, is the maximum limit. Uh, in response to Stuart Stevenson's comments about a minimum limit I think there's a, a degree of pragmatism that needs to be applied to this and you know that how long after the bill uh, comes in after the, the act comes into force would you reasonably expect there to be lessons that could be learned and applied and I think that rather than stipulating uh, a, a minimum limit I think it would be far better to, to take a pragmatic approach to these matters. Um, during the bill's stage one debate uh, on the 5th of February Stuart, Stuart McMillan asked me if I would support an amendment for a review clause to be added um, based on the recommendation contained in the stage one report and I said I'd be happy to do so. Um, this amendment I think meets the committee recommendation that the bill include a mechanism for review and that such review should take place within a reasonable time frame. Uh, I think that uh, Stuart McMillan's comments regarding the uh, role of Parliament in reviewing this as opposed to government I think are, are, are well founded. I think it will allow for a, a, a wider range of inputs than perhaps might be the case if it were simply the government that were reviewing the legislation, whatever colour that government may be. Um, I believe this amendment will ensure that uh, we actively learn from local authorities' experience of implementing the legislation and it will be vital to inform Parliament's consideration of how the legislation will operate in the future. Uh, it will also give the opportunity, of course, to draw on uh, examples from elsewhere. And I mentioned earlier in today's Stage 2 proceedings the fee transfer mechanism, which is very much in its infancy in Northern Ireland. It may be that the review period would allow for a more detailed consideration of how that is operating in Northern Ireland and whether such a system could be applied uh, readily in Scotland. Uh, and it will ensure that any proposed changes would be informed by evidence of the realities of implementing the legislation both in Scotland and elsewhere. So, uh, in summary, Stuart McMillan's amendment gives effect to the committee's recommendation for review provision, and I hope the committee will support Amendment 12. Thank you, Mr. MacDonald. Mr. McMillan, uh, would you sum up and press or withdraw, please? Thank you, uh, convener. Um, just, uh, I'll go through the, the, the points raised. Regarding the, the minimum period that uh, Stuart Stevenson raised, um, it's certainly, yeah, it may well be a valid point in terms of uh, actually putting in a minimum period into, into the amendment, but uh, I actually don't think it's necessary. Uh, I really don't think that, uh, that future uh, parliamentarians and, uh, com and the committee that actually, or subcommittee that will actually look at this in the future uh, will actually consider that, uh, if, say if I don't say they wanted to look at it in say two years time, uh, as compared to uh, three years' time or four years' time, I, I think there has to be that element of um, uh, of allowing the, the act to actually bed in. Allow it, first of all, let it pass, allow it to start, and let, then let it bed in, and then start to actually gather in the information. Um, uh, I think having a, a minimum period in there uh, might actually uh, not allow a full and thorough uh, review to take place at some point in the future. So it's, uh, I don't think there's a, necess a requirement for that. Regarding Margaret Mitchell's uh, point, um, there is a potential uh, for, that, for that to take place, uh, for it to potentially go up to the six and a half. Uh, but also, it is, five, uh, it is for it to take place no longer, uh, well, no later than five years. But depending on obviously the workload of the committee, uh, they might actually want to uh, to take that uh, to actually have the review period. Uh, well, to start the review period, um, it'd be a bit later. But um, but I. I, I I personally don't envisage that actually to be the case. Uh, I think we all uh, fully appreciate uh, this, uh, this has been uh, an issue that does affect many people um, across Scotland and the fact that there is uh, no legislation at the present moment um, and the importance actually upon this particular uh, bill, uh, I actually would not envisage that to actually take place. Regarding uh, John Wilson's comments, uh, I think the, mini uh, the Minister uh, certainly answered that and um, uh, absolutely correct, but certainly the Ministers and the Governments uh, certainly need to keep an eye uh, on what's actually taking place with it. Uh, the issue regarding the post legislative scrutiny, um, uh, the Minister uh, commented on this earlier, uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree uh, that, uh, that there is no need to actually have uh, a post legislative scrutiny element written into every bill, uh, because I don't think that actually would be uh, efficient and also effective. Um, but I think having it written into this bill, uh, in my opinion, is actually is a measured approach to an issue that uh, obviously there is no legislation at the moment. Um, and also it is very much a, a contentious issue across the country. So ha having it written into this uh, bill, I think, is, uh, is worthwhile. And finally, Mark MacDonald's uh, comments regarding the, the review operations elsewhere. For this parliament uh, to actually have a review in the future uh, would certainly allow, um, allow the, the expertise and the experiences of elsewhere 
uh, within uh, within these islands to certainly be fully considered as well. So having the having the review within uh, in this part, I think actually would be a very much a beneficial uh, thing for this bill and also for the country. And with that, I'm happy to move. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, uh, no uh, we're not all agreed. We'll go to a vote. Uh, those in favour of Amendment 12, please show. And those against Amendment 12, please show. Uh, and abstentions? Um, amendment 12 in the name of Stuart McMillan, number of votes for six, number of votes against zero, abstentions one. Amendment 12 is therefore agreed to. Um, the question is that sections 32 and 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Section 34, can I call Amendment 19 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, already debated with Amendment 1. Mrs Mitchell, to move or not move? Moved, Convener. Uh, moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Uh, we're all agreed, thank you. The question is that Section 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The question is that Sections 35 to 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Uh, the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you very much. That ends stage two consideration of the bill. Uh, I don't know if uh, members believe in luck, of, uh, particularly luck of ladybirds, but there's been one around about this room all morning. Um, members should note that the bill uh, will now be reprinted as amended uh, and will be available in print on the Parliament's website tomorrow morning. Uh, the Parliament has not yet determined when Stage 3 will take place, but members can now lodge Stage 3 amendments at any time with the legisl legislation team. Members will be informed of the deadline for amendments once it has been determined. Uh, I thank members for their participation today, uh, and I suspend this meeting for five minutes.
Okay. Um, agenda item two today is subordinate legislation. Uh, we're having an oral evidence uh, taking session on an affirmative instrument, uh, the Town and County Planning Fees for Applications and Deemed Applications Scotland Am Amendment Regulations 2013. Members have a cover paper from the clerk setting out the background to the instrument. Uh, Minister Mackay is still with us for this item and he is joined by Sam Anwar, Head of Planning Legislation at the Planning and Architecture Division of the Scottish Government. Uh, Minister, do you have any opening remarks regarding the SSI? I do. Thank you once again, uh, convener. Uh, the regulations introduce new levels of planning fees, which, if approved by this committee, will come into effect on 6 of April uh, this year. The charging of fees for planning applications has been law since 1981. These regulations are not seeking to change that principle, but the level of fee that we now consider to be appropriate for planning applications. I should make it clear that fees relate to processing of planning applications only. The wider resourcing of the planning service is a matter for each local authority. Audit Scotland reported in September 2011 that the funding model for processing planning applications is becoming unsustainable. To address this, we published a consultation paper in March 2012 on new regulations for planning application fees, which would have led to some substantial increases. Many respondents to the consultation paper, with the exception of planning authorities, indicated strong opposition to the proposed fee increases. Following discussions with COSLA leaders and other key stakeholders, I announced in December 2012 that it would bring forward regulations to increase planning fees and fee maximum by approximately 20%. I believe an increase of 20% strikes the right balance between supporting uh, sustainable economic growth and strengthening the resources of planning authorities. Uh, this will be the first increase in planning fees since April 2010. After taking into account the increase proposed in the regulations, planning application fee levels continue to represent a modest proportion of developers' overall costs. Users and potential beneficiaries of the development management system uh, should meet the costs incurred when determining planning applications, which would otherwise uh, fall to be met by council tax and business rate players uh, generally. But moving towards full cost recovery has to be done in partnership with all the various partners and stakeholders to ensure that it reflects where we are in the current economic cycle and that those paying the fees can expect a high quality efficient service for their money. To this end, we have formed a high level group with COSLA to review planning performance and drive improvement over the next 12 to 15 months. I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions the committee may have on these regulations. Thank you, Minister. Are there any questions? Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, I remember with joy bringing the last instrument forward in April 2010, as the Minister referred to. Um, in the Business uh, Regulatory Impact Assessment and uh, during his opening remarks, uh, the Minister made reference to um, the increased fees uh, and the link to improved performance. Um, clearly, that is uh, something which many in the development industry have been looking for, and indeed applicants generally. Um, I wonder if the Minister, in his uh, summing up remarks, might uh, enlighten us as to what actions may be taken, uh, either globally across all the 34 planning authorities uh, or uh, locally in particular cases if we do not see the kind of improved performance and in particular guaranteed performance uh, in relation to major applications that I think the government uh, and uh, the wider community uh, very significantly wants. Thank you, Minister, if you'd just like to deal with those questions now. Uh, sure. Um, in terms of the link with performance, the high-level uh, group um, has an aspiration towards to move uh, to full-cost recovery, and we'll put in place um, a, a range of measures which can improve the performance of the planning system, working in partnership with Heads of Planning Scotland, Planning Aid um, and others. And I, I, I like to think of it as a bit of a carrot-and-stick approach. The carrot is extra resources for planning authorities, the 20% increase as proposed. We have uh, allocated new resources to local authorities on a one-off basis through renewables and also new resources for uh, heads of planning Scotland and planning aid. A range of simplification and streamlining, improved performance and other measures and the next steps um, work I announced in Parliament 
and, and, and it was very, very helpfully uh, received uh, positively by, by members in the planning debate, shows a range of actions on pro improved performance, and that's a quid pro quo for the 20% increase. I'm obviously very focused on planning performance statistics, and we'll continue to monitor that, including looking at particular legacy cases, which I think have skewed some of the performance statistics. So I've mentioned some of the carrot, the incentivisation, the resources, the action plan. The stick is a measure I uh, propose to uh, support my colleague, Mr Ewing, uh, as the appropriate minister in the Better Regulation Bill, as a penalty mechanism, so-called, where if planning authorities consistently underperform and don't respond to the challenges, uh, that there would be a penalty where their fee, their planning fee, could be uh, reduced, and that measure will come to Parliament, of course, in, in, in due course uh, as part of that a bill, but I would much rather have that positive engagement, partnership and a range of actions to, to link fee increase uh, with improved performance. But I am absolutely determined as Planning Minister to see improved performance. Okay, John Pentland, please. Thank you, Thank you Convener. Uh, Minister, uh, uh, to me it's not surprising that, that the, the people who were most supportive of the planning increase was that of local authorities or planning authorities. Uh, bearing in mind that you know some of the the fees associated to some planning applications by no means meets that cost, and I know, for example, in my own authority, North Lanarkshire Council, they had to subsidise fees to the tune of nearly two million pounds uh, to progress planning applications. Now, I am heartened to 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 say to hear that you are talking somewhere in the future about full cost recovery. Would it be possible uh, to sort of give us a timescale for that? And bearing in mind that obviously in these times of austerity and, 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 and uh, where authorities are having to make cuts, I'm going to be concerned that the better service that we're hoping to promote through planning uh, uh, applications may in some way again be diminished because, you know, resources are having to be found to, to subsidise applications. Minister. I absolutely can't give a, a time scale because I'm completely dependent, which relates to Mr Stevenson's point on the performance of local authorities, uh, to improve that performance, which gives me the justification for increasing uh, planning fees further. So I can, in all honesty, give a time scale um, uh, for that work, but certainly will be very focused on that. In probing, though, the issue of full cost recovery, I think we need a full understanding of what each application would cost on a an authority by authority basis and a case by case basis. Uh, Mr Pentland might take a more sympathetic view on a householder application than you do, for example, a large supermarket. You may take a different view as to whether a subsidy is relevant, appropriate, justifiable or not. But we need a full understanding of the costs associated with each uh, planning application. And we'll do further probing work on that because I'm not convinced that the data we've got is sufficient to be able to set a real figure on that, and we're doing further cost analysis on that. I would make one reflection on fuel cost recovery. Planning fee income has actually increased. In the last figures for 2011-12, the figure is over £23.5 million, pounds, uh, which is up on the previous year and is up from the 2008-09 figure as well. So I think there's a valid question for those playing for planning applications. Uh, what exactly are they paying for? And I wouldn't want them to be paying for a, a bureaucracy that doesn't relate to their application, considering that planning fee income has gone up and the number of planning applications has gone down. So I want to make sure that if we're moving to full cost recovery, an aspiration that I share is certainly fair and robust to the people who are paying for those applications. And the final point is I understand the financial pressure that local governments uh, certainly under, and I'm sure that the member will therefore welcome, as he did in debate, that this is the highest single increase since the Scottish Parliament was created. Mitchell, please. Yeah. Good morning again, Minister. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps confirm the current gap in funding between expenditure and income and what the gap will be after um, these new um, fees are, are put in place. Emory Audit Scotland identified, I think, a gap of around £20 million of the figure that we had, and it's estimated through the 20% increase that could generate on the level of current planning applications between £4 and £5 million in that year. So that's the rough estimates that I have. But I do still, to go back to Mr Pentland's point, uh, I, I would like to probe the figures further to make sure that the, um, the cost analysis um, that we have identified is, is accurate. 
about 16 million, 15 or 16 million, um, between natural cost of processing and the income that is generated. And in these circumstances, then, Minister, I wonder really if it is realistic for um, the increase in efficiency and effectiveness which everyone wanted or so many people seem to seek from an additional, uh, additional charge in these fees to actually be achieved. Um, I take on board entirely that these are difficult times and the majority of the uh, respondents were against any increase and I think that's reflected in a very sensible approach um, for some of the, the lower end um, applications. However, I wonder did the government look at the position elsewhere um, in other jurisdictions for the fees charged for supermarkets um, and superstores? What's the, the cap there and how does that compare with what the, the Scottish Government is proposing? Yes, sir. I, I do see the irony in uh, Mrs Mitchell uh, challenging me on uh, supermarkets having supported or opposed the annulment and the public health supplement at particular fund raised from, from that sector. Of, of course we carried out the analysis on um, different applications across the different devolved uh, jurisdictions of, of the United Kingdom. It still may, remains the general point that planning fees in Scotland are generally at the same level or lower than um, our counterparts. Um, uh, in England, that said, you know, they'll obviously be considering their forward look for um, planning uh, fee increases as well. I'm happy to give the committee more detail on the individual cost of applications and uh, the equivalent levels in other parts of if the UK if you would find that information helpful, but generally speaking they're not disproportionate. The maximum fee I believe is, is particularly higher um, in England, but we have kept a 20% maximum and a 20% uh, increase um, is standard. If you want, I can give you some of those figures now. I can provide them. Um. Please, Minister, on the, the upper level for the, the very big applications that are so costly, as John Pentland pointed out, for local authorities to process, it was my understanding it would be hundreds of thousands as opposed to, you know, 19, 20, 19, 20,000 less than uh, as proposed under the, the regulation. Sure. I make two points. First of all, when we consulted with the individual sectors, we wouldn't want to upset any investment decisions that might be made uh, in Scotland and give the impression that we weren't open for business, which we most clearly are. Secondly, I think we need to, and I'm sure you would as a Conservative, focus on this is not simply about raising taxation or raising charges to fund a service without looking what people are paying for. And I think there's much room for reduction in bureaucracy more streamlining and simplification. So not only can we raise income to pay for the service, we can actually reduce the cost of the service as well. One example was that, I think last time I was at the committee or the time before that, was to discuss a planning change by way of regulations and that will take some cost out of the system. So hopefully reform will take some of the costs out as well. So between the increase in planning fee income and the reductions in cost, to see we can probe that further, eh, then we can get closer to that full cost eh, recovery. Uh, position. I also see the planning service as a public service. I'm sure the committee does as well. It's about the right development and the right places. And the public wouldn't necessarily object to a subsidy for some types of development. But that takes you back to who you want to um, assume full cost um, uh, recovery from. And the final point I would make is the planning system is only one part of a development viability or appraisal. Some of the assessments that go along with a planning application. The planning application might cost a maximum of £24,000. The cost of assessments or appraisals might be hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that's why I think we have to take a more proportionate approach and that's part of my next steps action plan as well. So I'm very much focused on the needs of the planning service communities and indeed the applicants who put a great deal of money into their proposals in the first place. Thank you for these comments, Minister, but I, I think a balance has to be struck. You know, big companies coming here don't want to lose that cost some money disproportionately. And if we haven't funded the system sufficiently well to, to make these improvements, then uh, are they really gaining in the wrong, long run for what seems to be um, top-end fees that are very much less than elsewhere in, in the United Kingdom? So perhaps you could reflect on that. It would be useful if you gave me some indication of, of what the upper level would be for these very big developments elsewhere. Mr. Yes. Anwar. Yeah. In terms of fee, fee, fees, uh, for example, a, a supermarket of 5,000 square metres in, in Scotland will pay 
after the new the regulations come into force, it would be 19,100. In England, it would be 21,000. So the limit. upper limit uh, in Scotland would be 19,100, and in, the, uh, in England, it would be 250,000. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that all applications, sure. large supermarkets, would, would, would achieve that, that up, up, mm -hmm. up maximum. So I suppose my question is, why have we restricted it to that without looking at an upper limit at all for, for these? You know, the recommended is, but, you know, to take cognizance of the circumstances, the complexity, to try and get it through um, smoothly and uh, efficiently. From memory, and it was some time since we looked at the original consultation that we consulted upon, if we had gone to a figure of, so the UK caps 250,000 and in the consultation paper we're proposing 100,000, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we had um, achieved that, it sounds attractive and it will still be less expensive than England, but actually because of the size of most of the new developments in Scotland, it would have had a disproportionate impact to the scale of developments in Scotland. And the sector was very keen to make that point to us. So we've been consistent with the 20% increase, it's easy to understand across the board, for both the planning fee increase and the maximum. I'm open to the committee's uh, views. As I was in the, uh, surprised by the parliamentary debate on planning, that there wasn't criticism of the planning fee increase, but maybe we should go further. I don't want to do it to the extent that it deters investment in Scotland, and that's why I consulted on it so comprehensively and took the bold step of suggesting an increase from the 19,000 figure to the 100,000 pound figure. But on analysis, it would appear that we would become almost immediately more expensive just because of the nature of the scale of supermarkets in Scotland if we were to do that at that stage. So I took quite a sympathetic view to that and kept the figure at 20%. You see, this is just the beginning of our consideration for future planning fee increases. And if the member of the committee has particular views about how I should direct that with local government, then I'm certainly uh, willing to engage in that discussion. Okay, thank you for these comments. Very helpful, Minister. Can I ask, Minister, uh, in terms of uh, what the applicant gets in terms of the service, is there much difference uh, between uh, what happens here and what happens south of the border? Um, well, uh, there, it, I think the issue here is that service uh, between Scotland and England is different. Service between each local authority is also variable uh, from the very good to the not very good. It, hence my support for a mechanism that can reflect that in fees, which we'll debate in the, in the future, um, I'm sure. Um, I, think to, I like to think that the planning service um, is improving. And key stakeholders like Homes for Scotland and others, because they were aware of the original consultation, I think warmly welcomed the 20% increase as a compromise because they know it goes hand in hand with an improvement plan. So I can't generalise and say that the planning service is better in Scotland compared to England. I'd like to think that it is as Scotland's answer to Eric Pickles, but uh, I believe the way we're taking forward planning reform is actually much more harmonious and adopts a partnership approach as opposed to bashing planners over the head, which is a policy I would not um, encourage. Um, so I think it's variable across the country. I do believe it's getting better, and I believe that the action plan and the range of actions we're taking will continue to make a difference. In terms of uh, the fees reduction stick, if you like, uh, which you hope to come into play, um, will there, along with that, uh, be a rolling out of good practice across Scotland? Um, from my own experience, I've seen um, some planning services uh, which have a huge number of processes uh, which seem to be um, a little bit unnecessary uh, and in some cases downright risk averse. I think that's an excellent point and we're already sharing best practice right now but um, I have a, there's an obvious opportunity here if there's practice that we know that works why isn't it mainstream across the 32 local authorities and the other two national park authorities as well so it is about mainstreaming best practice rolling it out and uh, ensuring that there is um, compliance with it. I could go on at some length, and I'm sure the committee wouldn't want me to, about our national planning framework and our performance framework and how we are encouraging planning authorities to emulate best practice. But I think the fee mechanism will be a very useful tool for, let's say, the more um, uninterested of planning authorities who are missing some of the clear opportunities that exist. We can, of course, discuss the mechanism in much greater detail, but the committee would be very interested 
uh, to learn that experience in local government is that the director of planning or the head of planning or the convener of planning takes a great interest in the service. I'm not sure that the director, the chief executive and the leader of every council takes a great deal of interest in planning, but I think my mechanism which could result for, of poor performance and reduced income for any local authority will suddenly take a great deal of interest in their planning service. Thank you, Minister. Um, if we could move on then to agenda item three, which is the debate and the motion to approve the draft town and country planning fees for applications and deemed applications Scotland Amendment Regulations 2013, on which we have just taken oral evidence. Uh, do any members wish to speak in the debate, please? No. Uh, in which case, uh, if no member wishes to debate the instrument, uh, can I ask you, Minister, uh, to formally move uh, motion S4M 05717? I move. Uh, the question is that motion S4M 05717 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, can I thank you for... Uh, given evidence today, Minister and Mr Anwar. Uh, we now move into private session, so I'll pause to allow the witnesses to leave and suspend this meeting.